Hello, everyone, and welcome to our Facebook Live today. We have a special Valentine's Day edition for all of you. So happy Valentine's Day. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, we hope that this time zone shakes things up, uh, different, different time slot for our Facebook Live today because we have an Australian guest with us, and we are so excited um, to host Fran Keto with us and uh, a, a lovely day to talk about finding romance in your family tree. So we're super excited about that. Before we get to that, I'll just let you know about a promotion we have going on at My Heritage. In honor of Valentine's Day, we are offering free access to all marriage records on My Heritage for free until the 20th of February. So it's an amazing opportunity to go and research your ancestors' romantic beginnings and how they met uh, and uh, you know their, their marriage records in our system. So make sure to check that out. We've put a link to that promotion in the comments section, uh, um, an entry on the MyHeritage blog where you can go and check that out and uh, research marriage records for all of your ancestors. So make sure to take advantage of that. In addition, we have a special DNA sale going on for Valentine's Day. So we'll put a link to that as well in the comments section. Um, before I introduce our speaker today, I'll just let you know also that we are excited to be giving away a MyHeritage Complete Plan today at the end of today's session. In order to enter, all that you have to do is leave a comment in the comments section and uh, let us know something that you discovered about your ancestors' marriage or how they met, <laughs> something having to do um, with them in uh, on my heritage. We'd love to hear about it. And we'll choose one lucky winner to win a My Heritage Complete Plan. Uh, if you don't know, the My Heritage Complete Plan is the best plan we have to offer at My Heritage. It will give one lucky user unlimited access to over 16 billion historical records, unlimited access to all of our photo tools, advanced DNA features, unlimited family tree size. So it's really an incredible gift. And we are excited to gift it to one of you today. Um, a great Valentine's Day gift. <laughs> so make sure to enter, uh, leave a comment in the comment section, let us know what you've discovered about uh, how your ancestors met or, or their marriage um, in the comments, and we will be gifting a complete plan to one lucky viewer. In addition, as always, uh, feel free to leave comments, questions, in the comments section. We love to hear from you throughout the Facebook Live. Uh, if you haven't yet, uh, write in and let us know where you're joining from. Uh, I, I see we have a lot of Australians joining us in the audience, which makes sense uh, due to this time zone. So thank you so much for tuning in. We love being able to bring you content as well, uh, no matter where you're located in the world. And uh, I'm sure we'll have many viewers who are watching this afterwards, uh, tuning in after it's been recorded. If you want to rewatch this, feel free to go to the My Heritage Facebook page at any time afterwards. And under the video section, you'll be able to catch the recording, as well as uh, the recordings of all of our other Facebook Lives, some really fantastic content that we have there. Oh, I see Linda's joining us at 7 a.m. from England. Thank you so much for tuning in, Linda. Happy Valentine's Day to you. Uh, and we have Precious Pam from South Africa. We have Derek tuning in from Tennessee. Thank you so much for letting us know where you're all tuning in from. It's great to see you all uh, all over the world. <laughs> Fantastic. So let me introduce our speaker we have with us, Fran Quito. And Fran uh, came to family history a little bit later in life. It happened when she was looking for a new interest that combined her interests of traveling, blogging, and technology. She's a regular Roots Tech ambassador, webmaster, and social media guru for the Kalundra family history and a host for ANZ Ancestry Time, Tuesday nights at 7.30 p.m. AEST on Twitter. Her other interests include sport and crochet. By day and most nights, she works in the family importing business. 
the wallpaper people to help fund her family history adventures. And it's not our first time having her and it's always a pleasure to have her on our show. So let me introduce her and bring her onto the screen here. Let's see if we can get her up here. Hello, Fran, how are you? Hi, Esther, thanks for the nice welcome. It's always a pleasure to be here talking. People who really know me will know I like talking. <laughs> We love having you. So thank you so much for joining us today. That's all right. You're totally welcome. And uh, I'm, I'm glad we could find a time zone that worked for everyone. And uh, yeah, we're, we're really excited to have you and to get started. Should we bring up your, your slides? Screen. Yep. Just let me click the screen little button. So nothing wants to happen. So no, it's just nothing's happening at all, sorry. No problem, take your time. Does it matter? It says the screen's unmuted down the bottom. So can I can no, I don't think I don't think that's it. Um but if you want we can remove it and then try again from the beginning to share the screen. Yeah, Should might be that? better too. Yeah. Just Okay. Let's try that. Okay. Every once in a while, we have some technical difficulties, but we always get it up in the end. So we'll we'll figure out how to share the screen. Um, is, it's now saying removed by host, but it's still sitting there. Okay, it's gone properly mm -hmm. now, so we'll start again. Okay, great. Type screen, share. Okay. There we go. You Let's see it? Here, we'll... Yeah, I'll just put it into the screen and we can get going. There you go. Take it away. Okay, thanks everybody for being patient. Um, Esther's description of this Facebook Live said that we're going to have juicy love stories in your family. But however, to get these juicy love stories, we need to start with some basic researching about your ancestors. So the talk's suited to beginners and hopefully the more experts will get some tips that might help them. And I've basically used a case study of a couple of um, my own family members and ancestors. So let me just go. What to start with? You should always start with what you know already. So check your records. And what I'm saying though is expand, whoops, Shouldn't play with my mouse, should I? Um, expand past the your vital records. So the advantages of starting with your own records is that you know what, find out what you know already. You create boundaries around what you need to know. Now, this is something that's really important for me because I'm short of time. So I like to know I should only be looking between 1836 and 1845. And that's what I mean by a boundary in terms of time or a boundary in terms of place. Like a lot of my relatives are from Essex so or London or Cornwall or New Zealand. So I don't bother to look for and I filter out things like the USA. So it helps you better define what you're researching and you can work out a research question or a plan. You can find gaps in your research and you might identify possible so sources. And I use a spreadsheet to do this and tick them off. So let's have a little look at an example with my research. Now, when I started, I knew hardly anything. I knew my name, my dad's name, my mother's name, which turned out to be wrong. Roughly when they were married, I knew my uh, grandfather on the paternal side, some of my grandmother's name. I didn't even know my grandfather's name on my maternal side, I should say. And the only thing that was really right was my Nana's birthday. And that was because she told us and made sure that we knew. Now, when I should not jump too quickly. So you need to go out and collect some basics. So for example, I didn't have any birth certificates or anything like that. So I got the marriage certificate for my grandfather and grandmother and found out more of their names. So you got Olive Beatrice or Constant Beatrice Island. But getting this was actually quite difficult. What happened was, I went along to births, deaths and marriages in New Zealand and in those days they had a whole lot of microfiche sitting there and you could look it up. 
Meanwhile, people are hovering all over you, wanting to get at the microfish, and I'm hunting through, and I cannot find, cannot remember my grandmother's name at that time, who made her maiden name Ireland, and I'm hunting through and hunting through and can't find my grandfather at all. So I can't find their marriage. I'm thinking, gosh, my grandmother's going to be upset. I've found out she's not married. But the people hovering finally made me move and I went to the counter and talked to the births, deaths and marriages lady sitting there. She couldn't find it either. So she asked if I knew my grandmother's maiden name and I couldn't remember it for trying. And then it came to me like it was meant to be. Yes, Ireland. It's not a good name for family history because every time you research, you get all that Irish research. But at least I remembered it. And she discovered when she looked it up, Kitto had been indexed incorrectly. And that's why I couldn't find it. And I'd spent probably two hours way over my turn trying to find it. But what it helps if you're lucky to have a marriage certificate like those from New Zealand, it just gives you so much information. I've got the date, where they got married at a Methodist church in Webb Street, their names, their ages, whether they'd been married before or not, where they were born, and of course the names of my grand great-grandparents. And it's even interesting that I've got names of who were the witnesses because it can all be useful to tell your story. So, but what other interesting things can you glean from all of this? I couldn't help myself. I go off searching and I find what the church looks like. Now, it doesn't exist anymore, but these wooden churches um, were typical of the time in Wellington in New Zealand. And there are a couple left, St. John's and St. Peter's, although they've got more imposing spires than, than the particular one my grandparents um, got married in. So then I, I wonder what should I get to look at next and I can't help it. In New Zealand you go to newspapers and papers passed and they're free and in Australia you go to Trove and again that's free and it's just so wonderful. Now I'm going to put a couple of newspaper things up over the time of presenting. I don't expect you to read them all. It's just to show you the quantity or the quality of um, printing or different types of things that you can see and find. So I don't expect you to sit there reading it. So in one article, I found that they got a whole lot of gifts, that they described the wedding party. Now, although this is all secondary evidence, it just gives you so many clues to finding out more about your family and your family tree. And don't always assume that there's only one particular article about a, a wedding or that the size of the article can be that bad. So I've got just a bit of a diversion. A smallest piece can help. Now this is, we've been talking about my grandmother and my grandfather. This is her half-sister Flora and when she got married to William Hooper, Barnard. So you can see, even though it's only a few words, you can see so much like the date, the name, their father's name, the place they got married, and even something like Cheltenham Papers Please Copy. Now, isn't that a place I can add that I should be checking if I'm trying to find out more about Barnard or Jeffries? Whoops, there goes the mouse again. But then don't believe everything you read in a newspaper. This is my great-grandmother, Mary Scott MacDonald, who was married to Jeffries, and that was the mother of the bride we just saw in the previous piece. And she had this notice saying that when she got married to my great-grandfather, James Ireland, in the newspaper. But although there's so little to go on, and I've found other clues since, such as my mother's grand. Uh, grandmother's birth certificate saying she got married in Melbourne, Australia, I've never been able to find proof of it. I've got no church, there's nothing on the New Zealand Society of Genealogy Indexes, nothing in the, <coughs> sorry, New Zealand births, deaths and marriage records, no Melbourne records, no passenger records to Melbourne and back. So 
It don't, you don't believe everything you read because I think it was one of those little parties that you have to say you get married. And I haven't been able to find her first husband's death before this period of time. So probably it was just a bit of a party and they were pretending they were married. Now, let's go down. Now, here's another one that I don't expect you to read. It's from the same wedding going back to my grandparents. And it's another example of that it isn't everything isn't exactly how it is in terms of family history facts halfway through or halfway through the first part it talks about Rini Kato sister of the bridegroom well he's actually a half sister she's actually a half sister and then it talks about what Mrs Kato wears his mother but it's actually his stepmother but at the same time you get so many clues that help and so, for example, I've got here R.J. Bell, who happens to give me my sis, my grandmother's sister's married name, a Mrs. McIntyre, who gives her half-sister's married name. But then I've got a Mrs. George Hill, and I still don't know where she fits into the story. So you can see that by hunting through newspapers if you're lucky you can actually get so much information and the one thing I do know to or I've told you I like putting these boundaries around things is if this wedding happened in 1913 in April these sisters must have got married before then so that gives me an end boundary when I'm looking for their marriages and you could infer other things like um, the wedding party is quite big, the article's big, the number of people referred to is big. So it was probably quite a social event at the time. And also people travelled to the wedding from Wanganui and Palmerston North, so it gives me some more locations. And then me, the next thing I can't help it is I want a photo. So I didn't have one from um, any family members, so I did a blog post because many people, um, other bloggers tell me that they manage to swap things with cousins and get things. So this is just a little bit of the blog post. And I wondered what Olive wear to her wedding. And you can... I, I just can't... Even today, I still think I cannot believe that someone found my blog post and sent me this and I just wondered you know like I wrote on the um, blog post I wonder if I'll ever find a picture of the happy couple with the family all dressed up as described and from the few words you could never imagine exactly what they'd look like they never described the puffy hats that the girls were wearing and the ladies it came with nine other photos including ones of my great-grandmother that I Mary Scott McDonald that's Olive's mother, the bride's mother. And the other thing then is with the newspaper articles, to build my story more, I can find out things. The newspaper said that Irene, Irene was part of the wedding party and her name's Irene Francis Kitto, and that Doris Constance Olive McIntyre was part of the wedding party. Now she's 10 years younger than Rini, so I assume she's the one on the left because she looks younger. So just a little diversion though, is that once you're collecting these wedding party bits of information, a lot of people who attend the wedding parties are a similar age. So again, having the boundaries of roughly when you need to look at um, someone might be married. Now I was looking for and we call her Rini because that's the name, but Francis Irene Kato. And so I started going through the electoral rolls, and this is off the My Heritage electoral rolls in 1935. And you can see she's still a spinster and she's 43 years old. So it means that if I'm trying to find a marriage, she might have never got married. She, I can focus on something else that I can actually get an answer. Anyway. Talking about photos, I just can't help myself. I just have to show you some of the other photos. So this is my great-grandmother on the left on my screen. So hopefully it is on yours too with my the little girl in the front is my grandmother. And then the this is my grandmother on the oval picture. And it's just such a nice 
nicer picture than this one here where she's doesn't look too happy and there's not much definition in her face but perhaps I should put it through my heritage improvement it might, she might come up a bit happier than that anyway so the studio picture looks much nicer and then the one in the middle is uh, my great grandmother when she's older and my grandmother's older sister Nellie and the photos had the names of the people and again the little girl is most likely the little girl on the left so I can put names to the photos so and plus I got to show you my photos which I can't help and let me just check where I am. Okay, finding things in your family tree is to do with romances. One of the things is a lack of maiden names. Now, I've been fortunate enough in that starting with this Sarah Scott. Now, I haven't joined the people up because it was just easier to do it like this. And I don't know if my mouse shows on screen, but starting with this Sarah Scott, we have one son's called Scott. My great-grandmother's got a Scott. Her son from her first marriage has got a Scott. The Scott, so this is going to be her daughter, granddaughter, great-granddaughter's got a Scott. My uncle, my father, my brother. One of the girls from the wedding party's got a Scott. And she's even got a Jamison that comes from the other side of her family. Now, this has really helped when I've been trying to track people down. And the little star down the bottom here is where I've got found a DNA match. Now, I'd never be able to find the DNA match if I hadn't done the research because every time someone gets married quite often, except for me, people change their names. So doing this Jeffries, McIntyre, Mackay, Mackay, however you like to say it, um, has really helped. So the map researching marriages has been a big thing for me a lot of people focus on births and deaths but marriages for me is a really good thing so now I'm going to do a little talk about oral history and one of the key things in a way to find romance in your street trees using oral history you may have had a story passed down the generations or it may be true, it may be a bit entertainment. And so in my case, when we asked dad when we were kids, how come, where did you meet mum? He'd say it was on the beach at Worsa Bay and she started chasing him down the beach. He'd been out sailing, so he was a bit worn out. Unfortunately, he was not at his top speed, so she managed to catch him. And according to dad, that was the end of his sailing days. And he was quite good sailor. I mean, this crew here, 1951, they used to win New Zealand championships in their Eidolong boat. So it was a big change being caught by my mother on the beach. So remember to write up your oral history. Collect it from different people. Different people might have the same story with a slightly different ending or a slightly different middle. And remember the name Scott before that was passed down things like that pass them down because um, it disappoints me I could have called my son Scott and it would have continued but anyway that's just a little selling point so if you remember the names passed down like Scott I also had some on my maternal side so Harry Grout Dawson's mother was Emma Grout Charles Collis Dixon my grandfather also has I think he's an uncle called the name I've got a first cousin with the name and others and it all comes from Anne Collis who was actually born in 1796 and then you can use now I don't know why I said you can use family oh use family census that's what I used and baptism data to find this sort of information about people's names so my New Zealand family, the Dawsons, um, come from the UK, mainly from Essex. So I've extended my story by looking at all sorts of things. And so I'm not going to go through them all in, in depth because they're the usual suspects, starting with the vital records from um, the General Registered Office, GRO, websites like My Heritage, newspapers, we've had some examples, 
Things like archives. In New Zealand, they have intentions to marry, which is from 1856 to 1956. And it was kind of like registering before you went off to marriage, before you went and you could get married. And sometimes they didn't go ahead. So you can actually find all the information about people, just about as much that's on that New Zealand marriage certificate. We've talked about oral history and we've talked about family records. Um, you know, the things at the very beginning where I said find out what you know yourself at the beginning to start with that. And so using all this, this type of things, you can start creating a story if you go beyond just indexes and certificates, beyond just the straight marriage records. So we'll have a little look at Mabel and how Vital and other records can help create a romance, a broken heart story, a mystery or an intrigue. Now this is Mabel. Mabel Kate Dawson was born on the 15th of March, 1881. She's my grandfather's elder sister. And so you can do some oral history, but if everybody's died, then you don't necessarily get the straight facts. So as I said, you need to back it up with some ordinary, basic um, genealogical research. Or you might remember something, or you might remember or ask your cousins, they might remember something. And so I had some scraps. I mean, we were told she married an American, he's part of a rodeo show, she played the sax and the piccolo, and she travelled to America with him. Well, some of this is actually false, I discovered in the end. But you can check out all sorts of things. And I discovered that she lived at 240 Kennington Road when she had her daughter, Alexander Ruby Violet, in 2003, I was going to say 1903. And this assumes that the birth certificate's correct, that she gave the correct information. Well, so she wasn't married when she got had her first child. But then I discovered that she got married a few months later to a Roman Victor Jose Byron by, by heart. Now she says she's a spinster and he's an artist and she's got no profession, but look where he was living. He was living in the place that she said she was living when um, Alex was born. So that sort of makes it an, a bit intriguing because you're not quite sure. And I sort of wonder is perhaps a, it might have been a bit of shotgun wedding because here is actually the signature of her father and her brother. So it's hard to know. Was this marriage? Oh, there's also 40, at 46 years and she's 22, he was more than twice her age. So was this marriage for love, convenience because she had a child to support or something else? Or was he even the father? Because I found out a few years ago that this particular house, many artists frequented. Now I'm going to give you another piece of newspaper here that I don't want you to try and read because it's very hard to read. But it's from 1926 in the Sheffield Independent and it's a he said, she said story. Oh, sorry, the story's in 1922. So basically, a Miss Laura Laws attended a meeting with Victor, or Roman Victor, um, at the London County Council Public Control Committee, where she opposed his renewal of his agency license, alleging that he used his office for immoral purposes. Now, he said last autumn he made a very big fortune, but that was but it was continuing with his application to clear his character. Laura said he promised to take her away for America, something where Mabel went earlier in the century with him. She said he was supposed to have a high position, own a motor car, have a wonderful flat and lots of jewels, but she had to lend him money, although he did repay her. And the chairman asked, did he seduce you? Yes, Roman denied this. The discussion continued when Roman admitted he had improper relations with this girl, but not at his flat, or not at his office, as his, at his flat. So he was implying it wasn't really that improper because it wasn't to do with work at his office. And he hadn't lived with his wife for 16 years. 
So they consider, the chairman and the others considered the case and said he could have his licence. Laura protested. She was not given a fair hearing, to which Sir George Piggott replied, if we have any impertinence from you, you'll be removed out of this building. So looks like we've got a hashtag Me Too situation in 1922. And as for the 16 years, in the meantime, at least he'd had at least one more relationship that I found and another child. So you can see that just with one piece of paper, you can create such an interesting story if you have collected and understand the rest of the things around it, like what happened earlier, when they got married, where they were living, those types of things. And I don't know why that's gone super big, but we will... It's all right. Um, did I say he was born in Mexico? As you can see, there's just so much more to this story. And Mabel's story in particular, she actually had to get back her UK citizenship because in 1924 they had to give her readmission for some reason the time she'd spent in Mexico she'd actually lost her British citizenship so a bit more anyway to tell you what happened Victor died on the 16th of November 1923 in Bucharest in Romania Mabel married a woman called a man called Stefan Klinik from Croatia in New Zealand in 1926. So Roman might have been a bit of a cad. However, Mabel found romance with Stefan and their marriage appears to have lasted 30 years till he died in the UK. And then after his death, Mabel continued to enjoy life. And I found her in um, shipping records in Jink. Kingston, Jamaica, and in Florida in 1962. And as a young child, I remember a lady visiting that I'm pretty sure was her and uh, letting me play with a large pile of costume jewellery she brought with her because Mabel really was a character. And one little, couple of little bits more. Um, a friend of mine, Sean White, she gave me a really interesting story about her parents met that's quite long so I won't read it because I see we're getting on in the time but the other thing is to blog it add it to websites and you can see she's got a um, website with my heritage and share these things and then you get more things back and my little summary slide is that if you can't remember all the things that you can try and do and where you can go and don't just stick to uh, marriage records, you can go off to My Heritage and look in their little research. Whoops, I want the mouse to go down. And you've got a whole lot of prompts here, like the immigration records have been really useful. Um, newspapers not necessarily in my heritage but for other people they could be good births deaths and marriages census records in the case of New Zealand we use the electoral rolls and don't also forget just get this powerpoint to come back up start with what you already know so you don't end up duplicating things and use oral history to your advantage and as Esther said before if you're not sure, start with this Valentine's offer with the free access. And I actually just found a cousin's marriage record because when I saw the offer come through, I couldn't help myself but go and look for some that I didn't have. And I found it just before. So can we escape from all of that, Esther? Ah, oh, there we go. Let's just, there we go. <laughs> Thank you, Fran. Oh, I'm so glad to hear that you found a record already in the in the marriage records on my heritage yeah. for the, um, yep. due to the promotion. That's fantastic. Yeah. So great to hear. So we do have a couple questions from the audience. Uh, in the meantime, anyone else who has questions, feel free to write in. Uh, and we'll just take a couple questions and then we'll do our yep. giveaway yep. if that's okay. Um, can you Fred? read them out? Because then I don't. Oh, no, hi, Mari. I see Mari's there yep. and Colleen's there that I know. Oh, gosh, it's good. And oh, 
must be some uh, some other people. I'm sure I know some others. I'm glad when my friends turn up. <laughs> um, a lot of familiar faces in the audience. So we have a question here from Derek who says, I know who my paternal great grandfather is. So we're looking for the marriage license. Tell me who my great grandfather Say that again. was. <laughs> I know who my paternal yeah. great grandmother is. Uh, we're looking for the marriage license. Tell okay, me who her my husband. great grandfather was. So did he say what place he came from? Okay, well, if no. if it's New Zealand, which is my best thing, and it's after, I think it's about 1844, you can look up New Zealand births, deaths and marriages, and you can type in something like just their surname, because there's so few people in New Zealand, you know, if, even if you get five pages to look through. Um, if it's in Australia, you need to go to the individual states to look for marriage details. And in the UK, you can go to um, GROW, uh, the General Registers Office, or you can look at one of the free DBM sites and they have all the indexes as well. If you're in certain places, the local family history group will often have microfish or things like that too. So without, unless he's left another little message to say where he's from, no, I haven't seen. May, Derek, if you if you hear this, may, uh, maybe you can comment and let us know so we can give a more exact answer. Yes, yeah. Um, uh, I yeah. also find Googling people's names, variety of their names, and a word like marriage and that, you surprise what you find. You know, I found something the other day when I was just setting up this talk. Um on some British gazettes of a piece of land that my mother's cousin brought. You know, you can get wow. weirdo things, like if you've got time. <laughs> so even even a good Google can do, and obviously use, check on places like My Heritage and that because they've got collections of indexes. Okay, sorry, do the next question. No problem. We have a question here from Ron who asks, I know who my grandfather is, Joseph Philwin, but I can't find any record of his parents. Joseph married Florence Caroline Penfold. So the question, I guess, is um, are the parents of the happy couple always listed in the marriage certificate? No. Um, some some places, New Zealand and Australia, are pretty good. Um, the other thing is that it actually pays to work that out. Now, I'm just going to find something here, which, oh, oh no, we'd have to share the screen again, so I won't. I'll just explain. That's okay. Yeah. Oh, okay. Um, that the group I belong to, Caloundra Family History, they made a list. So if you say, for example, go to birth, death and marriage information for New South Wales, it'll say it started at a certain date and they had this list of information. Then on this date, they added so-and-so and -so, and then this date, they added so-and-so. -so. so I assume that there'd be similar things if you're from the US or the UK that local genealogy societies would have because it's put you know, the boundaries that I talk about that I really like, it's pointless trying to find something if it doesn't exist. And how I learned this was trying to find uh, my grandfather's death information was I was looking and looking for the, um, what do you call it? You know, when, you, when someone dies and you do a review and it goes to all those courts and things, well, apparently the New South Wales people destroyed them. And so I'd been hunting for ages. So now I always look for what are the boundaries like is this information actually available so i don't know if that answers the question because trying no, to that's find very it, helpful. Yeah. um if it's something like the uk or new zealand i find a lot of parents using electoral rolls in new zealand or using um, census data in the uk and i don't just look up for say for example 1881 i will start at 41 or start at, you know, 81 and keep working backwards and track where the families go from this place to this place that they get married and then they're not some, they're somewhere else and use elimination. So if you've got 15 John Smiths in a certain town that you know, 
collect a lot of information about each one and gradually get rid of them. And then you might be able to find who the parents are by negative means rather than positive. Okay, um, so one last question and then we will uh, do our giveaway. So this question is from Liat who asks, uh, if I can't find someone on the regular search, is there a reason to also look for by the name in births, marriages and deaths? Oh, yes. And even beyond that, I would always look up at multiple indexes because remember on a particular site or, uh, and we, because we mainly do things on sites now, but say, for example, the microfilm I looked at, I couldn't find my grandfather's um, wedding. But when the person, when I went to the counter, the person had a different database to me and she could look something up. And I have found cases, you know, like I'm still, you're always trying to look for something, but I have found cases where I've got it in one piece and even a different site between different sites because they don't necessarily have the same information um, depending how people index them or they may have indexed them from different records or they may have been re-indexed. And so particularly you get typos or transposing pieces of information. So I would, unless you're actually buying the, I mean, inside my heritage, don't know. But yes, I still, I look up multiple things. Sometimes you'll get, say, a church record and it'll have different information than the government indexed record. So, yes, I would look up mm -hmm. more things than just the first thing. Particularly, a lot of things look like the primary information, but they're actually secondary. The thing was written at the local, like in the US, the county office, but the local register's office. Then someone created an index and then that index gets sent to the main GRO. So it could have happened lots of times. So it's not necessarily primary information. It's not primary if it's the index because it's not the original information. So yes, I would look up in, as many and as I in can. in terms of the... Oh, sorry. And uh, just in terms of the search, I know that on my heritage, if you if you select different types of collections to search in, it'll guide you on the information um, that you can enter for that type of collection. That'll help you uh, search within that collection uh, because there's obviously different different data, different types of uh, data fields in each collection. So when you click on the different types of collection, it'll it'll um, the the different search fields will actually change accordingly on my heritage, which is very helpful. Yeah. Uh, okay. So now we get to do our giveaway. Uh, very exciting. We received some really lovely uh, entries here in the comments section. Thank you, everyone who participated and wrote in to us. Uh, and our winner today is Helen Schultz. And Helen wrote to us a very interesting story. She said, great sadness brought true love. My aunt died in childbirth and her sister who cared for the newborn, newborn corresponded with my uncle who was away in the war and fell madly in love through their letter writing and married when he came ashore. So that's a really um, a tragic but yet beautiful story. Thank you so much for sharing that with us, Helen. Uh, that was lovely and we'll be in touch with you through private message to claim your prize so fran thank you so much for joining us today we really learned a lot and uh there were some lovely examples and great great photos and great stories as well thank you i hope people are inspired to look more into their romances and you can build a romance even if you don't know a lot just by doing ordinary proper research and don't forget, everyone, to take advantage of the free marriage records available on MyHeritage until the 20th. Uh, so almost a whole week left. Uh, we hope that you enjoy that promotion. And thank you, everyone, for joining us today. Thank you, Fran.